Thanks for the great presentation. I think it makes my job also much, much easier. Uh, to be the second is good. Uh, so I'm, my name is Bilgehan Uzunca. You can call me Bill. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Economics. Uh, and yeah, recently also got involved in the area of sharing economy. And this is a paper that we basically developed in the uh, last year. So it's a pretty also ongoing project. And I'm like working on this together with uh, Kun, Kun Richtering, Kun is also here. Uh, he's uh, working with me on this project in the Netherlands case. Well, uh, Punar is in Warwick in the UK, and Ali is in Egypt now. So basically, this is the team that we have. And uh, basically, the, the main, main story builds up on the uh, ending of Paolo. It was nice to uh, matching with that one. Like, uh, how much of sharing is really about you know, sharing and how, why, why do we still discuss the, if we are still discussing the definitional issues here. And we don't know what really it includes, yeah, are we including Uber inside the sharing in the, uh, in, the in the whole sharing economy thing. So that's why our, our title reads like, is sharing shaping and how basically sharing economy practices and the emergence of this, this whole phenomenon shows discrepancies across countries. When we go from one country to the other, that was also this, this last debate was uh, very much speaking into it. How much of the institutions you know, are involved in this? And <coughs> what are these platforms doing actively? So I'm like very much from a strategy perspective. What are the strategy, stra strategy implications of uh, what firms are doing in terms of, is it really about you know, facilitating sharing, helping societies, et cetera, or really trying to gain a market share grow into monopolies and become, yeah, uh, exercise their market power. So uh, this, this paper basically is like trying to answer this question, looking at it in a more macro level, definitely. So there's trust element in the, in the, in the project, uh, especially in the Dutch case, uh, because yeah, Dutch love uh, <coughs> making insurances. So the biggest problem is if I'm going to share my house, my car, my this, my that, the best of my possession, how am I going to trust to give it to this system? On the other side, the owner, the renters will say, hey, I, how am I going to make sure that really the house is in the good shape, the car is in the good shape, the drill is in the good shape, uh, stuff like that. So there's the trust element definitely in it, but it's more on a macro level, uh, firm and country level analysis. So it's currently under review in a special issue in the Academy of Management Discoveries. So we are not out yet, it's under review, <laughs> that's good news. But yeah, so I want to show you, if I can, does it work? No, it's because it's not connected, yeah. that's all, yeah. <laughs> Here, there's a... No? Ah, it works, yeah. Um, okay, so first I want to show you some examples. So uh, this is something I just actually took from Airbnb's web page. They have a, a disaster response program. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. But whenever there's an uh, earthquake, uh, some sort of yeah, fire, some natural disaster, some terrorist attack, whatever. So something that affects people. Airbnb says, okay, we activate our disaster response program in that area so that people that are affected can be, for instance, you lost your house in an earthquake, you can get free accommodation. So this is the, I don't know why the laser did, it shows, but the screen, yeah, the screen. So yeah, this was, most of you might remember from last summer, there, was, there were earthquakes in the uh, central Italy that destroyed a couple of yeah, villages. So immediately after the Airbnb activates its disaster response program, allowing the hosts basically to waive the fees and then you can offer your house for free for the people that are affected from that. Uh, similarly, recently there were like these wildfires in Chile and they apply this. Uh, basically that helps Airbnb to you know, cement its position in the accommodation industry actually. So saying, hey, we are helping your country, we are helping your region to you know, solve these problems. Uh, similarly, for instance, Uber. Uh, I don't know how many of you might have received such an email, but all over the world, there were many of these petitions. 
Whenever there's a decision to be taken in the local government, Uber was taking action, saying, let's ask the community, please sign the petition, help us, you know, stand against the government so that they, you know, don't ban our services. These are also like strategic moves that helps, you know, companies like Uber, Airbnb to, to cement their position in the industries. Basically what we want to look at in this paper is how much of this is really helping the society? It's not a quantitative analysis, but how much of it is really like, hey, we are helping the society, but we, our aim is actually to, uh, you know, gain a foothold, legitimize our services, and grow in that, in that country. So first of all, we have to put the boundary conditions. Yeah, I'm, I'm also going to touch upon the, the definition of what, it, what do we mean by sharing economy. There are multiple definitions, and yeah, some of them has been already mentioned. Uh, there's nothing sharing about maybe sharing economy. It's about accessing. So it's called access economy, gig economy, peer-to-peer. Yeah, -peer. And recently in a conference, I even saw this. This is interesting. So it's like not B2C, C2C, but I2C, so individual to customer. That's another label. Well, labels are multiple, but I mean, it can be defined like also since the card surfing was also mentioned before. So uh, participants granting each other peer-to-peer -peer temporary access without changing the ownership of the goods to their underutilized assets, possibly for money. You don't necessarily charge uh, in all the cases, but it includes some uh, money transaction as well. The well, special issue that we have submitted also had a definition, and that actually nicely develops you know, to, to what we mean by sharing economy in this paper. It says it's a socioeconomic ecosystem that commonly uses information technologies to connect different stakeholders in order to make value by sharing their excess capacities for products and services. Compared to the other one, it has commonalities, but I just underlined the important parts here. It's, it's, it defines it as a socioeconomic ecosystem. So what do we mean by, a, by an ecosystem? Some of you might be familiar with the concept, but like basically a network of different companies or institutions or organizations that work together, collaborate, for a service or product to reach the final user in the marketplace. So, but this is a socio-economic ecosystem that means that it's not like an iPhone ecosystem that one firm makes the chip, the other uh, firm makes the screen, and one firm just takes them as an integrator to you know, create this product. It's more of a multiple. This is our own view of you know, how to depict maybe a socio-economic ecosystem. Looking at, let's say, institutions, governments, municipalities, uh, incumbent com companies, like in the Uber's case, it's more like taxis, in the Airbnb, it's more hotels, like the ones that they disrupt. You have to pay, so you, you need some sort of a mobile transaction, some yeah, communities, organizations, and then it connects the lenders and borrowers. So it's basically your last figure in a more ecosystem perspective, if we can name it that way. So when we look at this, these guys are like playing such a game of balancing the interest of multiple stakeholders in this ecosystem. And that's not an easy job. And even more importantly, it shows strong discrepancies across countries. When we go from one country to the other, the government might be you know, stronger, weaker, the demographic conditions might be different. So one, one you know, place bans, the other is allowing it. Why, why do we see such discrepancies? No? Like, some countries don't even yeah, allow the Uber, X, etc. Even within the EU, which we say is a more or less homogeneous organization, there's like a fragmented approach. So the, if you cannot read it, the green is the allowed ones, the red ones are the completely banned ones, and the orange ones are like you can, the Uber pop is banned, but you can call it regular cap through the Uber and some of them has no presence. We have this type of uh, you know, discrepancy across countries. Why do we see such discrepancies? It depends on certain you know, uh, aspects of those countries. We can see like the socioeconomic or infrastructural. You know, if you go to that country, you can see different uh, level of internet subscri subscribers in that country, different uh, awareness, different yeah, trust issues also. Do, do people trust each other in certain countries more than others? Yeah, for sure. Or like the infrastructure, is it ready? You know, in that sense, yeah, you can go and uh, book a room in Airbnb in one country. It's like 
uh, very much in line with the regulation because it's protected, it's fireproof, etc. In another one, you know, if people just die while they are in an Airbnb accommodation, who is going to be responsible? Stuff like that. Uh, so it's a long list of things, but yeah, this, this is what we mean by the socioeconomic characteristics in a country, like if people live more in the urban areas, rural areas, do they have alternatives, like public transport options? Uh, how is the unemployment rate? Because in the end, what these sharing platforms provide is like self-employment, no? If yeah, there's high un unemployment, is it actually allowing people to go more for the self-employment? Um, yeah, definitely the trust issue that I, that I mentioned before, like the, um, how am I going to assure that the quality is there for the lender's perspective? And the misuse, like from the uh, supplier's perspective, saying like, hey, is, the, is my car going to be returned in proper way? Is my house going to be, you know, kept in the proper way? Is it safe? And yeah, awareness, so like, are people aware of sharing at all in that country? Infrastructure, similarly, yeah. So some countries take uh, proactive action. Some countries are more reactive. Some countries are not doing anything. The legal regulatory infrastructure or the public infrastructure, it includes all these urban water waste infrastructures and the financial infrastructures. Are we providing the proper insurance? Uh, do, they, do people have credit cards? How are you going to tax? It's still a big debate about, you know, how are you going to tax, like, the... Uh, the services that are provided in Airbnb, Uber, other, other sharing platforms. And given this context, imagine you are a company that enter a country, so you actually try to you know, shape this whole system towards your own benefit. And overcoming these type of challenges to shape the ecosystem in their favor. Like, yeah, Uber is the, the, the ones that I showed you, these strategies that they apply. Some literature that is yeah, b growing on this, so as I said, there's the growing literature on ecosystems, but they talk about more of the, the business ecosystems, the innovation ecosystems, that firms need to co-innovate together, they need to you know, work together to make a product reach the customer, but this is something different we are facing here, it's the social dimension of the ecosystems, that's why the, the depiction I showed you was like, a socio-economic ecosystem, that all these parties need to work together, they need to be aligned so that sharing economy platforms actually uh, take off in a, in a country. And the, the platform's role is important, they actually have a governing role. They offer certain contracts to the other parties to get them in, on board, you know, fighting with the incumbents sometimes, fighting with the regulators, or like, yeah, incentivizing them to accept their uh, this type of legitimacy seeking activities, for instance. How do they make themselves legitimate in the eyes of the consumer, in the eyes of the incumbents? So all these stakeholder parties, how do they accept such a formation? So in line with that, our research question is, how do sharing economy firms attempt to gain legitimacy by shaping their institutional environment across uh, different countries? Any questions so far? I, can I take questions during the presentation? Sure. Yeah? <laughs> so if you have questions, please, yeah. I would like to have it more interactive. Okay. What we did is, yeah, it started with the, actually, thesis project of the, the Egyptian student. He came to me and said, like, hey, I have access to the Uber managers and all the transportation, especially industry managers in uh, Egypt. Can I write my thesis with you? I said, why not? So let's, let's take a look at it. And he collected good data. Uh, basically, we then complemented it with our own network. And uh, the colleague in the UK joined for yeah, further extending this to you know, the Western, more developed uh, economies versus a developing economy comparison we ended up with. So in the UK, yeah, we talked to yeah, Airbnb, La Honswap, some yeah, industry associations are important. The SEUK, for instance, is the industry association where multiple small sharing economy platforms come together to be re represented against the, the British government. 
In the Dutch case, yeah, the Netherlands is like yeah, heaven for these things. I would say it's like full of small scale, uh, you know, share your drill, share your this, share your that type of any platform you can find. Um, yeah, we've talked to government officials, uh, the municipality of Amsterdam, uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, that basically the officers that are responsible for sharing economy. And also Sharon L, yeah, Peter can't be here unfortunately, the last presenter, we also talked to him. Uh, there's not like a very uh, active industry association, so Sharon L is more like a, uh, they define themselves as a networking platform that people get, you know, contacts, trainings, information, so it's more targeted for the small scale uh, platforms, but they don't say we are not an industry association, they say. And in Egypt, yeah, particularly we focus on the transportation industry because the housing uh, sharing concept is didn't take any market share yet. You can speculate about people don't trust each other, etc. So it's hard to, you know, maybe uh, establish such a thing there. But mainly the, the ones that are more uh, significant in that sense is like the Uber, Karim, Rakna. I don't know, yeah, you know Uber, but the other two, I don't know if you heard about their names. Imagine you are in Cairo, there is no parking option easily, like huge traffic, and you need to park your car. You open your uh, application, you ask for a person to park your car. It says, okay, in the next traffic lights in the roundabout, on the right, a guy with this sign will be waiting for you. You drop your car to the, yeah, Ahmed, whatever, in Egypt. The guy takes your car, parks it to the local parking garage. 15 minutes, you will leave the, your meeting place. You call back your car, and they say where you're going to pick it up again on the street. You're just exchanging cars. That's the app. But that solves a huge problem in the Egyptian context. Um, yeah, we did like a cross-country case study, all interviews basically with these large platforms, smaller platforms, regulatory institutions and other actors in the ecosystem. Uh, especially like yeah, Ali, Ali was doing his summer intern, so he actually went to job and come back home with Uber, Ragna every day. So he was actually doing also like interviews with these uh, taxi drivers, so to, to, to see uh, their perspective uh, as well. For example, like in the Dutch case, I told you that you can share everything. So Flow2 is one of the companies that you can, imagine you own a company, this is your company, and whatever you have, from the construction worker, to the meeting room, to the gardener, to personal assistant, to the excavator, if it's idle, you're not using it, you can post it in Flow2, and some other company might be interested in using your excess resource. So it's more on the uh, business side. Okay, uh, let's come to main findings. So basically what we find is threefold in the three countries. One is like the regulation in the UK, which is like a strong uh, regulatory infrastructure. And the, the country actually wanted to take, you know, especially uh, London should be like a sharing economy hub type of view they have. And uh, they are more, let's say, proactive in that sense. And what happened is the smaller companies, like the early sharing economy platforms that founded the SCUK, this, this industry association, gained like incredible amount of visibility against the politics. They hired like politically connected people and started charging actually membership fees even. Um, later entrants were more disadvantaged. In the Dutch case, we call it like, yeah, less affair, but it's more of a fostering approach. It's not that the, con the, uh, the government is doing nothing, but they are like, yeah, it's still taking off. Let's see what's happening. We don't want to kill such uh, small initiatives, especially. And in that sense, the very small platforms, regardless of their entry timing, so you can still open a you know, platform for sharing something, and you will have, let's say, more equal chances to penetrate to market, gain legitimacy, etc. And in the Egypt, Egyptian case, yeah, when the government is not taking an active role, and especially after the Arab Spring in 2011, you now the government's role is very much decreased in Egypt, it's such a context that the platforms are creating their own regulation. So they actually provide the trust that is not in the society. They actually provide uh, the regulations for, you know, the rules for 
yeah, like for instance, Uber's driver, how you decide on keeping someone in the system, not if the stars decrease below a certain level. And this type of uh, context gives the country, the, the, the platform, a uh, leverage unexpectedly for us because yeah, normally you would say, imagine the socioeconomic conditions and the infrastructural conditions I told you in the beginning. So how would you say like, hey, it will take off in Egypt? That will be like, no, come on, it's not like uh, the best context to have a platform to take off. But to quite the contrary, these problems actually turn into uh, opportunities in that context. So I will talk a lot, uh, a little bit about in detail. Let's go with the UK first. As I said, the early movers uh, formed this, this industry association. The founder says like, yeah, the companies that joined the industry association gained tremendous visibility. And then they charge, yeah, thousand pounds in annual membership and not everybody can pay that. What they do is they go and join uh, first the UK share, which is an informal group. We can say it's like the share and L of UK. And once they grow there, they're able to, you know, pay such a fee, they join the group that is well connected to the other uh, politicians, the, the government, etc. They that increases their visibility a lot. What, for instance, Airbnb does is like increase their local community ties and public service. And they say, yeah, we work with the fire departments, churches, community centers, and we try to, you know, if you rent your apartment through Airbnb, they give you fire extinguishers, they give you fire education, etc. So that actually like provides them to be deeply embedded in the community to help while also cement their position and increase their legitimacy in the, in the country. Uber is a controversial example. That's why like, is Uber really sharing? Not, so the whole community actually says, their business is controversial. That might damage our image as sharing companies. So they exclude them. What is the message from UK is like become the ecosystem orchestrators. Take the role in the trade association early on or hire politically connected individuals. Look like this founder of SCUK said our first full-time employee is the niece of a minister or, and the daughter-in-law of another one. So they take pictures with these influential people in dinners. That makes them gain an uh, incredible amount of visibility. So you go to all these events, etc. If you are later to the game, once this is established, then you are like out of the boys club. Dutch case. Uh, as we said, it's more like less affair compared to UK. There's not like so much intervention by the government. And it's, when it's, there's intervention, it's more in the local level, in the municipality level. So Amsterdam is like the epicenter of uh, the whole Netherlands, in the sharing events especially. Uh, so the Amsterdam municipality is taking more of an active role than the, the Hague government. Um, so like local uh, companies like the Dale, Dale Kelder is, yeah, some of you might heard about it. So you can share anything you have at your home, yeah, from a drill to anything. It says like every neighbor has actually a Dale Kelder. What was Dale Kelder in English? Yeah, it's like a basement that you keep all your tools, no? something like that. So every neighborhood has a Dale Kelder. Uh, and that's a, that's a more local thing. So the person you trust is you know, someone in your neighborhood that you can ask for such things. Uh, that what they aim is basically to increase this uh, social cohesion in a way that yeah, makes it from more local to the global trust. Or like yeah, creating awareness. People are people aware of sharing that much. Okay, we say Netherlands is a developed uh, country, but they, especially the, yeah, the local ones say, it's like a new state of mind. People need to get used to such a thing that I'm actually going on a holiday. This is the Heisenrail, the house swap platform that I can actually swap my house with someone else, not necessarily going and staying in a hotel. Um, yeah, it's again, similar mind shift. This is the flow to the one that I showed you about the, uh, the companies that share their uh, ownerships. And yet, yeah, the trust, this is the, the speaker that couldn't make it, so I can also cite him here. Uh, Peter told us, like, I want to let people share cars, but if I cannot get them the right insurance policy, <coughs> they are never going to share it. So especially in the Dutch case, this, this issue of the insurance trust 
came up again and again. What we saw is actually there's this sharing economy guarantee fund that is founded by some of the companies coming together. They say like if there's a mis like misuse, some debate, hey, you got my car and you return it in a worse condition, how are we going to settle such debates? They found basically like an the arbitration board to solve potential conflicts in the system. It's like a yeah, pool of resources that they can solve such disputes. I don't know how active it is and uh, how widely used it is, but in the end there is such an uh, initiation, let's say, in the, in the Dutch case. Um, when we talk to the, yeah, the government officials, they say in the Netherlands, like, we don't want to overregulate. We don't want to kill those social initiatives. We want to see. When the legislation should be ab adapted, then we just take action. But if, if it harms the society, then we take action. Otherwise, we want to watch and see, because it's just a new phenomenon. It's just taking off. But Uber is the only exception, because they enter a country in a very disruptive uh, way. So they say, tomorrow onwards, we are active in this country. Everybody that has an idle car lying in their garage can start being taxi drivers. Well, for being a taxi driver, we learned from the Amsterdam municipality that you need to spend around 5,000 euros in total to get a license, training, equipment in your car, etc. Then you can be a certified taxi driver. In a country like Netherlands, if you just uh, say, I'm going to be a taxi driver riding my own car, they will say, hey, you're not safe, you're not certified, I don't know what will happen if you have an accident, this, that, you're banned. So the approach is more like, yeah, the Airbnb is having, for instance, more of a collaborative approach, whereas Uber is following more of a disruptive approach in that sense. And Egypt, I believe it's like uh, among the three the most interesting case because of the uh, difference in its all, yeah, the infrastructural conditions and the socioeconomic conditions. So what they do is like, especially localizing strategies. You can't pay with cash in Uber, no? Normally not. But Egypt is a country that has 99% of internet connection, pen penetration. Everybody has smartphones there. But the credit card usage is 3 to 5%. If you want to yeah, think, think about yourself as Uber and you want to penetrate a country like Egypt, or like the, uh, the Karim, is the local version of that, you have to localize your strategy. What does the region need? They need cash transaction. So we introduced cash. You can pay with cash. That has actually sold their uh, you know, the legitimacy seeking, the market penetration problems incredibly. On the other side, like while building legitimacy, we are talking about solving some local problems. Imagine in Egypt, the GPS signal is not even that you know, precise or strong. Uber invested $500 million to upgrade these GPS systems in Egypt. One of the Uber drivers say, like, yeah, it's not perfect. We have to contact the clients by phone. We ask them, can you come to the main road? Because some of the roads, the infrastructure is also not good. But some of the clients are good, but others ask us to drive into roads that most SUVs won't survive. So that's like also, <laughs> how am I going to pick up my uh, customer is a, is a problematic thing. But what does this provide to Uber is if the government is not able to do such an investment and improve the GPS signal, etc., provide these services to customers, and then Uber does it, what will be the reaction of the Egyptian government? Okay. Yes. If they really invest 500 million, yeah. It's a lot of money. Yeah. This GPS signal. Yeah, so I don't know what they did. So. 500 million. Source is super. <laughs> check it. Check it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in another way, so they they collaborate also with the regulatory ones. So look at the Uber manager in, in operations manager in Egypt says our relationship with the government is extremely positive. <laughs> Just keep on the back of your mind the, the Dutch case. Like since the strikes in the beginning of the year, they have been reaching the government has been able to see the benefits. 
because the, we, we can provide the economy by being regulatory mediators. If you cannot provide certain services and Uber is able to provide those services, the government has not much option but actually to accept you. Yeah? Would you say it's a kind of a bribe? Bribe? Yeah. Well, if the government is not able to offer such solutions and Uber is doing that, we actually have other yeah, quotes about uh, the, the members of the parliament. We talked to them also in the Egypt and they say, we are very happy because they provide all these solutions that we couldn't provide. Would such a thing happen in the Dutch case? Do we have such problems here? No. So like then uh, solving such problems give them a, like a leverage to gain legitimacy against the, uh, the other parties of the, the ecosystem, if you keep that in mind. Some I know Omar. Oh, yeah? OK, so these are not made up interviews. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so si some symbolic strategic actions. Also, Egypt is a country, for, for those of you not familiar with, 99% of the women face harassment, some form of harassment. And 80% of this 99 is actually happening in the public transport. So if you cannot provide such a safe and reliable transportation, Uber's rating system, reputation system, actually makes up for this. So we had a woman who drew poorly and wrote sexual harassment as a comment. 30 minutes after the operations manager of Egypt, Uber, calls, apologizes, gives extra credits, and says what they did with the driver. The interesting thing is, this is okay, it's a good thing, but what they do is they post this on Facebook. The following day, this is the most shared news on the Egyptian social media, the Uber rides skyrocket. Similarly, the Egyptian member of the parliament, yes, yeah, safety for women in trans public trans is a very important thing, and uh, tracking and rating systems, th this can be policed heavily when using the uh, apps like Uber and Karim. There are even a larger number of drivers as working as, like women, uh, working as drivers in Egypt. That's something normally, if you think about the taxi service, it's unbelievable. And even they collaborate in a way that the taxi drivers don't know what harassment is. So in a, literally, it's like a, a, a woman gets into your car in the taxi driver, you just look at the mirror and then some acts does not even make sense as a harassment. So the boundary is not that clear. What Uber does is they uh, collaborate to give some training to their drivers. So say, if you do this, that's harassment, don't do that. <laughs> Literally, in this level. Um, and there's something called the harass map, that's the Google Maps integrated, uh, like a map of Cairo, I opened it, you can search in the, in the Google. Uh, whenever a woman, for instance, faces harassment, they report what it is in the, lo in the location. So if you open the Cairo map, it's most, more or less red everywhere. Some parts are more red. But like you can actually work with these companies as Uber to say, hey, I'm s making a big step that the government doesn't do to solve such a societal problem. Can you imagine such a thing in Netherlands? So in the this is my last slide. I know I'm over time. Uh, we just look at basically these different countries in terms of their socioeconomic characteristics and infrastructural conditions. What looks like a negative thing for the sharing economy to emerge? Economically weak customers, low skilled workforce, and high un unemployment rates, inefficient public transport, lack of strong institutions and regulation actually work not against but in favor as an opportunity for these companies to leverage and then you can sit down at the national level against the government and say, hey, you are going to accommodate us because we are solving your problems. In the Dutch case, you just come and there's no problem maybe to solve in this scale. Then the government says, sorry, you're not fulfilling the legislation, you are banned. Then they start working with the local level, more bottom up, saying, okay, we will get the ta taxi licenses, give us some time. It's more like a negotiation process than going on in the current state. So in the developed countries, you can follow either like a uh, local level bottom up or like in the UK case, form an industry association of the whole small platforms, and that will be representing you against the government to yeah, get the regulation for accommodation. That's it, yeah, thank you.